Good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Church. It's really a blessing to be able to welcome you this morning as we prepare to worship God together. Before we begin our worship service time, I want to point out several things by way of announcement. You can find the announcements uh, starting on page 14 in your bulletin. First is, if you're visiting, uh, we want to welcome you. We're glad that you're here. And if you didn't have a chance, make sure you pick up uh, a bulletin. It has everything you need as we walk through the service. And then uh, if you're a believer joining us from another church and you've been baptized, you can pick up Lord's Supper elements. We'll be having that later in the service as well. Um, and those are the main things that you need to know. Um, my name is Craig, and it's, it's great to be able to welcome you. I'm one of the pastors here. When we look at the announcements, there are a few scheduling things happening. Uh, I think we've all been stretched scheduling-wise of uh, when do we show up, when do we not. So everyone's doing a great job. Um, thank you. And um, next week, we're going to put it all to the test, though, because daylight savings time either starts or stops or whatever it is. I never know. Uh, but you fall back an hour. And so what I think that means is if you forget... And if you forget that there's no discipleship hour, you're going to be here a long time before anyone shows up, I think, is what will happen. So um, anyhow, you could grab a broom, and I'm sure there are sidewalks to be swept off or something while you wait, and then we'll all show up and welcome you. So you'll, you'll notice next Sunday, um, daylight savings, and then also we won't be having discipleship hour because it will be um, week three of our co-laborers in Christ teaching, uh, where we come back for that at 4.30 to 5.30. Um, next Sunday. And so take note of that. It's all listed there for you on page 14. Also on page 15, just a few things to take note about that are coming up very quickly. Finding Jesus in the storm. Um, so talking through how we can honor Jesus as we uh, live with mental health challenges. Um, you can see the description there. It's a, a beautiful group that's a, a blessing and pray that you'll be encouraged. If you're interested, um, Ryan Wenzel can answer questions. They also need you to RSVP because lunch is included. So take note of that. That's uh, coming up very soon. And then Lamb's Players Theater, Christmas play, December 2nd. Um, the details are there as well. It's always a great opportunity of fellowship and just enjoying the arts together um, as God's people. So um, those are things I just wanted to direct your attention to as well as uh, the rest of what's there. Well, now we can uh, turn to the beginning of our bulletin where we have our call to worship. And our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 29. And one of the things that you'll notice as we read this together responsively, which we'll do in just a few minutes, is it begins with the splendid glory of God. Just talking about who he is, um, how, how beautiful and wondrous his glory is. Then it moves into his power over all creation, and then it moves into that power that's expressed in his word is also for his people. And that's an amazing thing, that this all-powerful God who created everything that we see is also for us, strengthening us. And you'll notice there in verse 11, um, blessing his people with peace. And that's God's word to us this morning. I'm not sure how you've come in today. Many of us find ourselves in need of strength. Many of us find ourselves in need of peace. Many of us find ourselves in need of orienting our lives around something far bigger than just the here and now, namely the God who created us and more importantly, even loves us in his son, the Lord Jesus. And our songs will walk us through this psalm response as well. We'll sing together, O Worship the King, which helps us consider the wonder of God's creation and his ineffable, hard to even put words to, love that he has for us. And then that takes us to the peace and the rest that he brings through Christ as we're stayed upon Jehovah, as we fix our hearts upon his faithfulness and not our own efforts or works. And so uh, that's that's the movement this morning that God invites us into, considering him and then also all that he brings us in Christ, the peace and rest to fix our hearts upon. And so I invite you to stand if you're able as we hear God's word and as we hear him call us to worship. I'll read the regular print and then you can join with me in the bolded text. This is God's word. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. 
Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as a king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let me pray, and then we'll sing in response. Our Father in heaven, help us to hear your voice today, your powerful voice that brings us from death to life and forms us more and more into the image of your Son. We pray that you'd help us to worship you in the splendor of your holiness. And we pray that in worshiping you, you'd align our hearts to your faithfulness, your love, the rest and peace that comes from knowing you and that we will one day fully enjoy. Help us in all this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's lift our voices to so in song this morning. Thank you. 
Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace over all victorious in its bright You may be seated. Good morning. Today's scripture reading found on page six in the bulletin and also page 301, 301 in your pew Bible is taken from 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 1 to 18. Page six in the bulletin and 301 in the pew Bible, 1 Kings 19 verses 1 to 18. You can follow along as I read. <clears throat> Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now. O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank, and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
There he came to a cave and lodged in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Pray with me. <clears throat> God, we uh, come to your presence this morning to worship you, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, for you are greater, and there's none like you. Um, all creation is so different from who you are, O oh God. You are the God of heaven and earth, the creator of all things the upholder of all things, a God who is holy, just, and righteous, and good, also a God who is long-suffering and kind, a God who fulfills all his desires and all his purposes, even in a fallen world. Your power is so great that for your children you work all things together for good, even evil and bad things, Lord. You are so great that you preserve for yourself a people that do not bow their knees to other gods in this world that has exchanged your glory and, and made for itself various gods of their own imagination. Yet you have, before the foundation of the world, chosen us in your Son to reveal yourself to us. You have called us out from a fallen race to be your children, to bear your name, to be indwelt by your Spirit all because of the death and the resurrection of your son, because of his perfect law-keeping on our behalf, and because of his death on our behalf and his resurrection. You have covered our sins. You have forgiven us much more. You have declared us righteous in him. Lord, you don't count our sins against us this morning. Lord, when we look at ourselves and even just a week gone by, we must confess that we have failed and we have broken your law. We have fallen short of your holy standards, whether it's in things that we said, in deeds that we've done, in the thoughts and intentions of our heart. Lord, we, we face this tension and the struggle um, as our flesh pulls us towards, towards worldly things and, and towards sin. And, but how great is, is, is the power of, of the salvation that you have wrought in your Son, Lord, that you have 
brought sinners to yourself and washed us clean, spotlessly clean by his blood. And, and we thank you for that this morning. Uh, we thank you, O oh God, uh, that, that you rule um, in Christ. You rule um, the earth and, and the kingdoms of this earth. And, and there's no one that can dethrone um, our Lord Jesus Christ. He's exalted. He's seated uh, at the right hand of the Father. And, and Lord Jesus, you are great in your power. Um, you yourself have said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. And you have commissioned us to go uh, to all nations. And, and we remember your church as it spreads through the globe uh, in places where it's, where it's not even permitted uh, to gather such as this to worship you. We thank you that your, your word is going out through your servants. We thank you that your spirit is at work. We thank you that you are causing uh, those that are spiritually dead to come to life uh, each day and your kingdom grows, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we worship you. Lord, this world is in turmoil. Um, and there's, there's wars raging. There is uh, just rampant loss of life uh, that, that we hear about each day. Thank you that you rule even over this and evil will not finally prevail. Lord Jesus, you will come and you will be just and you will judge this world in all righteousness and, and none will escape your hand and everyone must give account before you. We thank you that that is coming, that, that all things will be taken into account, that in the end righteousness and holiness and justice will prevail and, and we wait eagerly uh, with, with all creation for the restoration of this earth. We wait for the new heavens and the new earth when you will make all things new when there will be no unrighteousness, when there will be no evil, when there will be no sin. Lord, and we will, as your children, live with you uh, forever and ever. Uh, even now, as we wait for that and the frailness uh, of our own bodies um, uh, and, and, and the weaknesses that we carry around and, and just um, even as our bodies fail us, Lord, we, we thank you that you will recreate and renew our bodies um, uh, to be with you forever. Lord, you will come and you will restore all things. So we wait eagerly for the resurrection of the body. And we trust, Lord Jesus, just as you came before to, um, to, to work salvation for us, you will come again and complete that. And you will restore all things. So we eagerly wait for you. And we thank you that this moment we can share together and worship as a foretaste of what is to come in eternity where your children will be gathered on your throne and will worship you through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. The next song we're going to sing is on page eight of your bulletin. It's a song that helps encourage us to express our dependence on the Lord in the morning, throughout the day, and in the evening with the goal of his being glorified today. So let's stand, if you're able, and sing together a Christian's daily prayer.
We'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 11. We're continuing our study through this marvelous uh, book this week. We're, we're finally making it to chapter 11. Um, you don't have to answer this out loud, but um, I'm, I'm wondering how many of you might have lists of films that you want to watch. Um, I have a list that I just kind of keep in my head. And a few weeks ago, I finally got around to watching a film that's been on my list for many years, I, I think at least a decade. It takes me a long time to get to any of the films on my, on my list. It's an older film by a director I really like. And... Um, I was just riveted by this film. My uh, friend had told me I would enjoy it. He was right. Um, just, you know, throughout the movie, um, you kind of think you know what's going on, but you're never quite sure. And, um, but then towards the end of the film, about the last 20 minutes or so, there's this major plot twist. And it, it kind of just left me speechless. And I, I realized that... Um, I hadn't really understood what was going on in the film. The plot twist kind of connected some dots, but then also made me realize like, whoa, this is so different than I expected. And, and I need to go back and rewatch it. I haven't done that yet. But, but when I do to go back and watch this film, knowing about the plot twist, my whole perspective on the, the plot line will be different. And as we turn the corner into Romans chapter 11 today, it's, it's kind of like we're, we're coming up to a, a giant plot twist. And, and Paul's been hinting at this um, ever since chap, chapter 9, but he, he starts to get into it in, in full now. Um, since chapter 9, Paul's been describing Israel's rejection of the gospel, that um, the, the long-promised Messiah has come, um, and yet Israel has not embraced him. And, and Paul ends chapter 10, which we looked at last week. He ends with this very vivid image of, of God, as if God has been standing with hands and arms outstretched to Israel, pleading with Israel to receive their Messiah, pleading with Israel to believe the gospel. And, and Paul, quoting from the Old Testament, um, says that, Israel is a, a disobedient and contrary people. They, they refuse to embrace the good news of Jesus Christ. They've rejected it. And that raises a big question. If, if Israel has rejected God's gospel, does that mean that God in turn has rejected his people, Israel? And that's kind of the, the pressing question that Paul's really been getting at all throughout chapter, chapters 9 and 10, but really starts to take it head on here in, in chapter 11. Has God rejected his people? Has he given up on them? Has he set aside his promises? Has he even failed to keep his promises? And, and if God has rejected his people Israel, what does that mean for us as Christians? I mean, d does that mean that God could or would reject us as um, his people? You know, what confidence can we really have that we are secure in Christ if, if God would 
reject his own people, Israel. And so you, you can see what's at stake here. These chapters aren't just um, about history. It's not just, you know, theological trivia. This is about the, the character of God. It's about his integrity. It's about his faithfulness to his people, his faithfulness to his promises. And, and that's the question. Is God faithful to his people or does he just toss them aside at some point? You know, he gets fed up with their, their disobedience, their contrariness, their, their reluctance to believe. Does he just set them aside? Is that what God does or can we trust him? Can we count on him? And, and Paul's answer here in chapter 11, which we're starting to look at today, is that God is always faithful to his people. God is always faithful to his people. And I, I want to read the passage for you. We're looking at Romans 11, verses 1 to 10. I invite you to follow along. That's um, page 946 in the Pew Bible, if you want to follow along there. Hear what God's word says. Romans 11, beginning in verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and bend their backs forever. Let, let's pray as we come to God's word. Our God and Father, we pray that you would give us eyes to see today. We ask that you would give us ears to hear uh, what your word says about you, what your word says about your glory, your majesty, and your grace. Would you give us a clearer um, vision of who you are for us as our great covenant God, as our Lord? Would you strengthen and encourage us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the, the outline today is very simple. Two, two points. Paul shows us two things here about our God. And the first is that God does not and cannot reject his people. God does not and cannot reject his people. The second point is that God is both sovereign and good. He's, he's sovereign, absolutely sovereign, but always good. And so first, let's, let's look at what Paul says, that, that God does not and cannot reject his people. We see this in, in verses 1 to 6. So again, chapter 10 left us with that picture of God pleading with Israel to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Israel, for, the, for its part, just stubbornly refuses, stubbornly refuses to receive the, the promised Messiah. And Paul asks in verse 1, what are we to make of this? You know, he, he does this throughout Romans. He poses a rhetorical question and then proceeds to, to answer it. Um, you know, has God rejected his people? And it seems like the logical conclusion, right? I mean, after everything Paul has said about Israel, all the opportunities they've had, God's word going out to them, the promises, the history, God's faithfulness to them, and yet they've not received his, his word, it seems logical to conclude that, that God's done with them. I mean, they're, they're done with him, apparently. Um, why wouldn't he cast them aside? But you see in verse 1, Paul's answer, by no means, may it never be. I mean, 
he says that so many times in, in Romans. It's, it's this idea of, no, 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 it's impossible for God to do that. God does not and cannot reject his people. He's always faithful. And, and Paul, you know, he poses the question, he, he gives you his answer, and then that, next he gives you three proofs, three proofs for why God has not rejected his people. And the first proof, proof number one, is simply Paul himself. Verse one, you, you could call this the personal proof. Has God rejected his people? By no means. And then Paul says, I myself, for I myself am an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. In other words, what is Paul saying? Has God rejected Israel? No, I'm a believing Israelite. I'm a believing Jew. And you know Paul's story. I mean, Paul was uh, an Israelite who was opposed to God's gospel, to the gospel of, of God's grace in Jesus Christ. I mean, he, he explains this for us numerous times in his letters. He was a, a violent persecutor of the church. Um, no one in Paul's day, uh, I should say when he was known as Saul, no one thought that Saul would ever become a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. And yet, on the Damascus Road, everything changed. I mean, God sought Paul. Christ pursued Paul, and God had mercy on him. And Paul becomes a, a devoted follower of Jesus Christ, the apostle to the Gentiles. So, proof number one that God has not rejected his people Paul himself. Obviously, God has not given up on, on Israel. Proof number two, not just the personal proof, but, but now a, a theological proof, God's foreknowledge. God's foreknowledge. Verse two, Paul again says, God has not rejected his people. And then notice what he says about them in verse two. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And you know, just a reminder, we talked about this a bit back in chapter 8. To be foreknown by God is to be foreloved by God. God's foreknowledge of his people is not simply God looking down the corridors of time and seeing who would choose him. This is, is God's sovereign, gracious, loving choosing of a people to belong to him. And, and Moses, you know, reminds Israel back in, in Deuteronomy and other places about this when he tells them that you've been foreknown by God, chosen by God. He reminds the people, it's not because of anything you have done. It's not because you're more righteous than the other nations. It's not because of anything about you. Moses tells the people, God chose you because he loves you. And why does he love you? And, and Moses basically says, well, he loves you because he loves you. That's, that's who God is. God sets his love on the people whom he chooses. And so this, this proof here, Paul is saying, consider who Israel is. They're the, the foreknown, foreloved people of God. And, and the point is, look, if God graciously set his love on this nation, he's not going to just set them aside. How could he reject the people whom he foreloved? That's not the kind of God he is. You know, human sinfulness and human disobedience don't cancel out God's sovereign love and election. Um, one commentator said, God cannot unknow the people whom he foreknew and foreloved. And so the first proof is the personal proof. Paul himself is a believing Israelite. The second proof is the, the theological proof that Israel is the nation whom God has foreknown. The third proof is biblical precedent, and, and Paul unpacks this, um, the, the latter part of verse 2 um, down through verse 5. He, he recounts the story of Elijah, which Aaron read for us a little earlier, and so in that story of Elijah, you know, wicked queen Jezebel um, tell, sends a messenger to Elijah, I'm going to have you put to death. You, you're toast. You're done, and, and Elijah flees to the wilderness. <clears throat> He's depressed, he's discouraged, and, and God, you know, comforts him, encourages him, sends his angel to him. And, and Elijah, in, in that, that story, he feels like he's the only faithful Israelite left. You know, here he is, 
the one who has not bowed the knee to Baal, and he's, he's living out in the wilderness um, without friends, without provision, all alone. He, and uh, Paul quotes him there in, in verse 3 as saying, I alone am left, and they seek my life. And then you have Paul quotes God's reply to him, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In other words, you're not alone, Elijah. You're not the only faithful one. I'm, I'm doing far more here than you realize. You, you can only see a little slice of, of the story, a little slice of the picture, but God tells Elijah, I haven't given up on Israel. I've, I've preserved a faithful remnant. And, and Paul connects that Elijah story to, to his day. He says in verse 5 that that's exactly what God is doing in his day or, or the present time. And I think there Paul doesn't simply mean that at Paul's, in Paul's day God is preserving a remnant, but the present time, this whole new covenant era, God is preserving a remnant, Jewish Christians who have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. And We've already encountered this idea of remnant in chapter 9. Um, you know, this idea of an Israel within Israel. Um, you know, the majority of the Israelites at that time had rejected the gospel, but not all. Paul himself is proof. Um, all the other apostles were, were Jewish. Um, we read in the book of Acts that thousands of Jewish men and women um, were embracing the gospel. And yet, by and large... Israel had, had rejected Christ, had rejected Messiah. And just like Israel's predicament in Elijah's day um, looked hopeless, but God preserved a remnant, Paul saying, so it is now, so it is. It, it seems as though Israel has turned its back on its God, and yet God is preserving a faithful remnant. Now, I think Paul is, is aware that we can get the wrong idea here. We hear this Elijah story, 7,000 faithful men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And it kind of sounds like, okay, well, the remnant are those who haven't worshipped the false god. In other words, um, human faithfulness explains the existence of a remnant. And Paul says, nope, not a chance the remnant exists, verse 5, because of God's gracious choice. They are those who have been chosen by grace. And, and Paul will not let us forget this reality of the primacy of God's grace. His grace comes first. The, the existence of the remnant is not due to human faithfulness. It's, it's God's sovereign, free, unmerited grace that has brought about this group of faithful, gospel-believing Jewish men and women. And, and Paul's not content with just saying, well, they're chosen by grace. Verse 6, he just keeps hammering this message of grace. Um, look at what he says in, in verse 6. Um, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. In other words, grace by definition, you know, just the, the whole point of grace is that it excludes works. Uh, grace and, and works, acceptance with God on the basis of grace, acceptance with God on the basis of works, they're just antithetical to each other. And, and you know, Paul, I, I guess he just, he knows the human heart. You know, he knows our tendency as as fallen, finite, weak, frail human beings that, that we just gravitate towards the works idea, right? We just gravitate towards this idea that somehow, some way, our performance, our, our merit, our faithfulness will put us in good standing with God. And Paul just, he tells us again and again in Romans, it's not by works, it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And it is, it's very fitting that, that we're hearing Paul's um, statement today about grace and how it excludes works. This is uh, Reformation Sunday. Some of you may be aware of that. The last Sunday in the month of October, 
Um, many Christians celebrate the, the Protestant Reformation on, on Reformation Sunday, the, the anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the, the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. You know, key moment in the Protestant Reformation, and, and one of the key doctrines the Reformers recovered was this gospel of grace, that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And, and Paul even though he's talking about God's big plan for Israel and what's going on there, he just does not want us to forget this reality that you and I, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are saved only and always by the grace of God in Jesus Christ apart from works. And so Paul here, he's, he's telling us that God's faithfulness to his people is rooted in his grace. It, it, it's not a response to their faithfulness. It, it's rooted in his sovereign, free, unmerited grace. And he's always faithful to his people, even despite his people's unfaithfulness and failures. Now, now you've got to realize, Paul's talking big picture here. You know, God's plan for the world, God's plan for Israel, his, his plan to create one people for himself— Jew and Gentile in Christ. And, um, you know, big picture, God is faithful, doesn't reject his people. But, but we need that same reminder at a, at a personal level. Not just, you know, big picture salvation history, but, but God is faithful to his people, each and every one. Personally, we need to hear that God is faithful to us. And you might not realize this, but, but we as, as human beings, we're constantly evaluating God's faithfulness. I don't know if you realize this. We're, we look at our circumstances and we're constantly making assessments. Is it, what does this tell me about God, about what he thinks of me, what he's doing with me? Um, you know, if, if God really loved me, um, would he let this happen? Um, you know, it kind of looks like he's against me. I don't understand all these circumstances. How, what other conclusion could I come to? Uh, maybe he's forgotten me. I mean, how else do you explain this? And, you know, most of the time, none of that's going on very consciously. You know, this, this constant evaluation, um, assessment, it's just kind of there in the background. It's like background noise, and there's this this running inner dialogue that, that is filling our, our minds, you know, almost all the time, and we're not even aware of it, and yet it's there. And what is the problem with measuring God's faithfulness by our circumstances? Um, there's all kinds of problems, but, but one that, that I heard someone talk about recently that, that stood out to me is that we're assuming omniscience, and, and I mean we're assuming that we are omniscient, that, that we see everything clearly, we know everything clearly, we can accurately project what's going to happen in the future, and we're, we're acting as if we're God. We're acting as if we, we know everything and, and can predict how the future will play out. And, and typically, and I think this is true for many of this, uh, for many of us. I don't think I'm just the, the lone ranger here. For, for many of us, our conclusions, as we look out and kind of evaluate the scene, our conclusions are usually pretty negative, right? Um, we're, we're not usually um, thinking, wow, things are looking great and the future is bright. We're thinking, this is terrible and there's only disaster ahead. Um, you know, we, we predict the worst possible outcome. Uh, we, we focus on the negative. We, we play the what if game. You know, well, what if, what if this happens? And then what if this happens? And then if that happens, well, what if this happens? And it's just this, you know, litany of, of negative thoughts. And we're assuming omniscience. We're assuming we know. We're assuming we can predict. We're assuming we can figure it all out. Um, in, in the mental health world, there's a name for this. It, it's called automatic negative thoughts. In other words, ants. And, and many of us have an ant problem. <laughs> it, you know, there's a, a swarm of, of ants in our, in our minds. And, you know, we're, 
we're encountering circumstances and we say to ourselves, you know, we've got this, this background dialogue going on and we say, well, yeah, you're right. I mean, God must have rejected me. That's why this happened. Yeah, you're right. I mean, God doesn't care about me. I mean, why would he let this happen to me? These, these bad things that are going on. I mean, if, if he loved me, cared for me, protected me, there's no way any of this would be happening. Those are the ants. Those are the ants swarming your mind. And, and this is where, um, you know, this whole um, talking to yourself is, is so important. You know, some people will talk about preaching to yourself. You, you've got to insert yourself consciously in the middle of that dialogue. You know, rather than just letting it go on um, without paying much attention to it, you need to say to yourself, hold on, wait a second, is that really true? Is that really what is going on here? It, it, do I really see things the, for the way they are? Does this really mean that God has given up on me? Or am I just focusing on all the negative things? Um, you know, am I trying to predict the future? Am I, am I just overgeneralizing here? You know, this, this one thing happens and then I tell myself, well, this always happens and it always means this and God never comes through for me. Or, or am I just catastrophizing, you know, just expecting the, the worst uh, things to happen? Um, some people call it doing your pain in advance. You, you come up with this whole scenario of how terribly things could go and you experience all the mental and emotional anguish of it now and it may or may not ever happen. Doing your pain in advance. You, you have to talk to yourself and, and, and begin to challenge your, your wrong thinking. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a, um, a Welsh preacher, pastor in the 20th century, and he said, so much of our unhappiness in the Christian life comes from the fact that we listen to ourselves instead of talking to ourselves. We, we listen to that, that negative stream of, of thought instead of challenging it. And that's, that's the second part. You, you talk to yourself and you challenge those thoughts. You know, Paul kind of does that here with his readers. You know, based on what he said in chapters 9 and 10, you could come to the conclusion that God has given up on Israel. He's done with them. Um, but, but Paul challenges that and says, no, look, look, I'm a believing Israelite. Look at what God has done in history through um, in the time of Elijah. He's doing the same now. Consider what it means for Israel to be foreknown. You know, we, we have to challenge those negative thoughts, the ants. You know, put a dent in that, that assumption we have that we're omniscient. And, and then that opens the door to reframing your circumstances. You know, rather than just interpreting everything in the most negative possible way, you know, you, you challenge those thoughts and, and you start to think, well, maybe this this thing that happened, you know, um, maybe it doesn't mean that God has rejected me. Maybe it's not a sign that he's abandoned me. I mean, Paul has told us again and again, God gave his son for you. <laughs> That's got to mean something, right? He gave his son for you. The Bible says that God can't stop loving me. He won't reject me. Maybe there is more going on here than I realize. And I, I think, you know, the, the lesson for us is to stop listening to ourselves and to start talking to ourselves. And you might want to do that in a private place so people don't think you're crazy. But God does not and cannot reject his people. He doesn't ever and he won't ever reject his people. That's the first thing we see here in, in Romans 11. The second in verses 7 to 10, we see that God is both sovereign and good. He's sovereign and good. And, and Paul, in verse 7, he, he sums up Israel's predicament. And you see, he poses another rhetorical question, and then he answers it. And then he cites Scripture to confirm his answer. He says in verse 7, what then? What are, what are we to make of all this? And he answers, Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking, that is, 
a righteous standing with God. Israel failed to obtain it. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. And so Paul um, talks about three groups here. Israel as a nation, and he says they've, they haven't obtained righteousness. They've been seeking it by works, and so they've failed to obtain it. The elect within Israel, the remnant that he's been talking about, um, they have obtained it. They've received grace. They've, they've received it through faith in Jesus Christ. But what does that mean for the rest of Israel? And Paul says, the rest were hardened. The rest were hardened. And hardened in, in what sense? And, and Paul's talking here about a, a spiritual um, blindness and deafness, a, a spiritual insensitivity, a, an inability to respond positively to God's offer of salvation. And, and you notice there that the verb is passive. They were hardened, but clearly um, Paul is saying that God himself does the hardening. And, and Paul is, again, repeating what he said in chapter 9. We've talked about this a bit. I, I won't repeat everything uh, we've said, but Paul showed us in chapter 9, God shows mercy to whom he wills, and God hardens whom he wills. And, you know, clarification, though, that, that doesn't mean that God forces people against their will to reject the gospel, but, but God does harden some sinners. And, and back in chapter 9, Paul used the example of Pharaoh. You know, we read in, in the Exodus account, numerous times we read that, that Pharaoh hardened his heart and stubbornly refused to let God's people go. But, but twice as many times we read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Um, earlier in, in Romans, back in chapter 1, Paul said that God hands some sinners over to their sin. And so Paul brings in this reality of God hardening. He says that the remnant received grace. They obtained righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ, but the rest of Israel were hardened. And he, and he quotes the Old Testament to confirm this in verses 8, 9, and 10. Um, you can see in some of your Bibles the way that it's printed. You can see that these are, are quotations. Um, it's really interesting how Paul does this. Um, he quotes from three main the three main divisions of the Hebrew Bible, the law, the prophets, and the writings. In verse 80, he combines Isaiah 29, the prophets, and Deuteronomy 29, the law. In verses 9 to 10, he, he quotes from the Psalms, the writings. And, and what is Paul's point in citing these verses? God gave them a spirit of stupor eyes that would not see, ears that would not hear, down to this day. And then when he quotes from the Psalms, let their table become a stare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. What, what's Paul's point? He, he's saying none of this should surprise us, Israel's rejection of the gospel, because Israel's own scriptures say that Israel suffers from a spiritual malady. Just like Moses said of the children of Israel in the wilderness, that they, they couldn't see and appreciate God's deliverance for them, so Israel cannot see the deliverance God has provided through Christ. Just like in Isaiah's day, Isaiah could say God's saving word is not getting through to God's people because their eyes are closed, their ears are closed. So it is with, with Israel and the gospel. God has given them a spirit of stupor, um, Isaiah says. And just like the enemies in the psalm of David who were um, persecuting and, and attacking God's anointed king, Israel in rejecting the gospel has rejected God's anointed king, the true king, Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, the, the remnant has obtained grace, the rest were hardened. And, and that's a sobering truth, isn't it? This reality that, that God hardens some sinners, that he, he gives some sinners over to their sin. Um, it might not sit right with some of you. It, it might sound maybe unfair, unjust. 
Um, it, it certainly makes most of us feel a bit uncomfortable. I mean, this isn't how we like to think about God, right? We, we don't want to think of him like that. We, we like to emphasize his saving work, his mercy, his grace, um, what he does to rescue sinners from their sin. And, um, you know, we might recoil a bit from these kinds of truths about God that, that Paul, you know, he brings them to us again and again in, in Romans 9 through 11. And, and why, why does that happen? Why do we recoil from things like this? And, and I think part of the, the reason is we tend to have very one-dimensional views of, of who God is and what he's like. Um, we, we struggle to, to hold together everything that God reveals about himself in Scripture. You know, we, we fall into this either-or thinking. You know, either God is holy or he's loving, not, not both. Either God is a God who saves or he's a God who judges, not, not both. Um, either God is sovereign and, and we are robots, or God is not sovereign and we're free. We have, we have, so, we have trouble holding together what, what Scripture tells us about God. And we need to remember something that's just fundamental about who God is, and that is that he is infinitely bigger than, than our finite, fallen minds can grasp. Um, and Paul is going to finish this chapter, which we'll see next week. He's going to finish this chapter on his knees, praising God for God's infinite and incomprehensible wisdom and majesty. As, as Paul unpacks all that God is doing in salvation history, he's going to say it's, it's beyond our ability to fully grasp. And the proper response for God's people is to bow in humble adoration over who this God is. You see, God, the God of the Bible, he combines in himself qualities that, that we tend to separate. He, he is holy, and his love is holy, and his holiness is a loving holiness. He's a God who saves and a God who hardens. He's, he's absolutely sovereign, and yet he's always good. And later, Paul's going to say about this hardening of Israel that, that it's actually a part of God's grace-filled purposes for, for his people. He's not finished with them. The hardening is temporary. You see, God's sovereignty in saving whom he wills, hardening whom he wills, God's sovereignty and his goodness are not in conflict. They're not in competition. Um, both are true. Both are glorious and praiseworthy. He's a good God. He's always good, but we don't control him. God's not constrained by what our ideas of, of what he should be like or, or how he should do things. And, and, you know, let's just be honest for a moment. That's unsettling to us, that, that God is not this, you know, domesticated God that we can dictate to that we can control. Um, we're not always comfortable with God's freedom to be God. And C.S. Lewis, you know, he really captured this dynamic in a, a very memorable way in, in the Chronicles of Narnia. I, I think I've shared this with you before, but um, in the story, Susan, one of the older children, visits Narnia for the first time. And, and all the characters in Narnia keep talking about um, Aslan, the true ruler of, of Narnia. And she, she gets very curious, very interested to know more about Aslan. She thinks he's a man. And um, she asks Mr. Beaver, a, a talking beaver, this is a story. Um, she asks Mr. Beaver about Aslan. And, and Mr. Beaver tells her, no, 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 he's not a man. He's a great lion. And, and Susan, in her very, um, you know, prim and proper British way, um, says, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Is he safe? And, and Mr. Beaver, he just has this classic reply. He says, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. And, and that's the key here when we encounter truths about God that, that unsettle us, it's, it's remembering he's, he's never safe. 
He's not controlled by us, but he's always good. And so what do you do when, when God's godness um, just, it, it unsettles you? What do you do? You know, one option, well, you could just dismiss it. You could say, that's, um, I, I don't like this. My God is not like that. That's not how I like to think about him. And so you can just, you could just dismiss what the Bible says about him, ignore it, set it aside. But, but that is not treating God as God. That's, that's remaking God into an image after our likeness and our imagination. That's one option. Um, Probably not the option, you, you can tell that's not the option I think you should take. The, the other option is to embrace that unsettling truth, knowing that he's always good. Knowing that he's always good. And, and how do you do that? Um, I'll never forget, I read something years ago that the theologian Michael Reeves said. And he said that there is no God in heaven who is different than Jesus. And the way you embrace those unsettling truths about God, knowing that he's good at the same time, is by looking to Jesus. You, you rest in the God whom we see in Jesus. Uh, Jesus shows us who God is, right? I mean, this is just fundamental to our faith. He shows us who God is because he is himself God. God the Son in, in human flesh. I mean, Jesus said to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There, there is no other God in heaven who is different from me. I, I'm showing you who God really is. And so if you want to know what God is like, you look to Jesus. And what kind of God do we see in Jesus? We we see a God who is absolutely sovereign. I mean, the most basic confession of, of the Christian faith is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is sovereign. He's, he's powerful. He, he wields all authority in heaven and earth. But also, we see a God who is gentle and lowly. A God who welcomes sinners. A God who is... Uh, shows compassion and mercy to outcasts and the, the spiritually broken. We see a God who is not indifferent or detached to human pain and suffering. We see God in human flesh standing in front of Lazarus' tomb, weeping because his friend Lazarus has died. We see God in human flesh weeping angry tears because of what sin and death have done to the world. Uh, we see a God who invites anyone, everyone, to come to him and promises to give rest to all who trust him. We, we see in Jesus a God who is both powerful and humble. A God who is both king and servant. And, and it all comes together at the cross, doesn't it? I mean, at the cross, these... These what seem to us separate um, streams of thought about God and different characteristics, they come together at the cross. We see God's holy hatred of sin, and yet we also see God's holy love for sinners. Uh, we see God's wrath poured out on the sin bearer, and yet we also see God's love in giving to us his son. We, we see the sovereign king, Lord Jesus Christ, lay down his life. Ultimate power and authority and at the same time self-giving love. Jesus shows us who God is. He's, he's sovereign. Absolutely sovereign. Uh, unsettlingly sovereign and yet always good. A God who doesn't reject his people a God who became the rejected one for his people. A God who doesn't give up on his people. A God who gave himself for his people. This is the, the good news we see in Jesus. That God does not and cannot reject his people. And that our God is gloriously sovereign and yet always good. And 
I'll just close with this. I, I don't know what kind of week you've had. I don't know what kind of month you've had or even the year for that matter. Um, although I should say I do know what, what kind of month and year some of you have had. But I suspect you need to hear this. God is always faithful to his people. Don't look at your circumstances and conclude that God must have forgotten about me. God must have rejected me. God doesn't love me. It might feel like that. It might look like that. But your circumstances are not the measure of God's faithfulness. God does not and cannot reject his people. He is always, always faithful. He's always good. And, and I just want to ask you today, will, will you trust him? Will you rest yourself, your life, your family, everything in his faithfulness? I mean, th that's Jesus' invitation, right? Come to me, everyone who is burdened and weighed down, and I will give you rest. Trust him today. Rest yourself in his goodness and faithfulness. Let me pray for us. Our Father, you know how weak and frail we are, how weak and frail our faith often is. Would you help us to see your faithfulness, your sovereignty, your goodness, and your greatness more clearly than we normally do? Would you strengthen that weak faith? Would you give hope to those of us who may be wavering in hope? Would you assure us by the power of your word and your Holy Spirit that you will never set us aside? Would you assure us that you are always faithful to us? In the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. A lot to think about there. A lot to consider. And I'm trusting that all of you believe what was spoken this morning. Because so we come to the table of communion, it is a table that's indeed described by Paul as a cup of blessing and a cup of sharing in the body of Christ. And when we break the bread and drink the cup, it's a sharing in the body and blood of Christ. That word sharing is very important. It's a Greek word koinonia or communion. So as we come to the Lord's table to partake of the elements, the table is for those who believe all the things that Ryan's been talking about, that God is sovereign and that he is good and that he has not forsaken his people. And how do we see this? We see this at the cross. Jesus Christ was an Israelite. He was of the tribe. He was the son of David through his father, Joseph. And he came as the true Israelite, the servant of the Lord, to fulfill the purpose of God, to live a life without sin, and then lay at the end of three years of his public ministry to lay his life down, to give his life as a sacrifice to be delivered over to the Gentiles by his own countrymen, by the leaders of his own nation, so that he might be crucified on a cross and that his shed blood, God would recognize as the perfect sacrifice, <clears throat> just as all of the, um, the high priests throughout Israel's history, the line of 
the lineage of Aaron's tribe, would sprinkle the blood on the elements of the temple, the, the, the articles and the furniture of the temple to purify and cleanse them, that those lambs and those bulls and those sacrifices represented the one perfect sacrifice that would come and that would be all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So that now today, as they look forward then, we look back now that that shed blood by the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, through faith in him and what he did, that we are accepted before God, that our sin is punished in him on the cross, and that his righteousness is imputed to us by faith. And God reckons this to be true, so that when we come before God's throne and we want to find grace and help and mercy in time of need, he accepts us. That's, that's what this cup and this bread, simple as it is, that's what it represents. And so this is for you if you believe this. You're, you're all welcome here. We're visitors. Uh, we're, we love it that you're here and you're hearing these things. But if you have not yet been baptized and not embraced this as yet, then please just let the elements pass. But we would love to speak with you, explain further about the grace of God that Ryan talked about and the wonders of God's love. Um, and through faith in Jesus Christ, we would uh, love to have you join us one day, someday soon, perhaps, young or old. It doesn't matter who you are. So this is for those who are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and have been baptized in his name. Now, I think we're going to sing a song. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. And are we seated? Yeah. Please remain seated. Jesus, past unmeasured, boundless free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me.
Before we partake together, let's, let's bow in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, Heavenly Father, you are so good and so kind. You sent your only begotten Son so that whosoever might believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He went to that cross and laid his life down. And now through faith in him, we have this koinonia, this fellowship together, and it unites us, unites us as we look to you, Lord, because we can be grateful to you for the forgiveness and the grace that you have shown us and given to us. And coming to your table of communion, we know we have fellowship with you, first of all, and fellowship with one another. And so now as we come, we ask, Lord, that you would please bless our fellowship together today. Thank you for the word we've heard and strengthen us as we go from here later. But now, Lord, we commit to you ourselves, and we ask your blessing now on the table as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, when he had taken some bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the bread, he took the cup and he said, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's drink together. And Luke records for us on that night, that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples before he was crucified. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come in Christ, but we yet wait for its full revelation and full fulfillment and then we will drink it together with Jesus Christ at the great wedding feast that he tells us about, that John writes about in the book of Revelation. So may he come quickly. And in the meantime, may we be faithful. May we walk with joy in the grace of Christ because he has done such wonderful things for us. And if you don't know this yet, if you have not embraced this yet, we pray and wish that you would come. Speak to any one of us, any one of us. We'd love to talk with you. But now let's sing together again. We will feast in the house of Zion. If you can, please stand with us and join your voices together in song. Say 
sing the doxology. with the joy of Christ. I hope you feel what I'm feeling. Hear God's benediction and blessing. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen.